Welcome to Barnsley. Barnsley has a thriving community today, but also a past to be proud of. A huge part of that past is, of course, its coal mining story. Barnsley has a huge part to play in the coal mining story of Britain, and you can't get any closer to that story than when you're here at the site of Barnsley, Maine. These buildings here aren't just relics of a time gone by. This is some of the best surviving architecture, some of the best surviving evidence of the coal mining heritage that makes up a lot of the rich history of this local area. But how did it come to be? What's its story? And also, what is the story of coal mining in general? Why is it so important? Why must we remember it? To find out these answers, to quote Julie Andrews, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Now a town with a population of over 96,000 people, Barnsley had much more humble origins. Originally in the parish of Silkston and called Burnsley in the Doomsday Book, it only had a much less impressive population of about 200 people. It then started to develop from 1150 when monks from Pontefract Priory built a town where three roads met. Then in 1249, it was granted a royal charter, meaning markets could be held. It then flourished as a market town in the following centuries. It was also a centre of manufacturing, with glass making and linen weaving being renowned industries. However, it was coal that really helped put Barnsley on the map. Coal has been a huge part of the UK culture for much longer than you may think. There is evidence that coal was being used in prehistoric Britain over 5,000 years ago. Then, in the Roman period of Britain, coal was being used to heat places such as public baths or the houses of rich families. In around 1215, coal was being taken from exposed seams in the sea and was being traded in Scotland and Northern England. However, coal was being dug directly from the ground as early as the 1300s. However, coal mining didn't really take off until the Industrial Revolution. Primitive coal excavation techniques such as bell pits and gin pits were becoming outdated because the need for coal grew so tremendously. Coal was so important to the UK because it fulfilled numerous purposes. This ranged from heating the homes, to powering the furnaces, to fueling the ships and the trains. In 1750, the country was producing over 5.2 million tonnes per year. In 1850, it rose to 62.5 million and in the 1960s, it was producing a staggering 177 million tonnes, employing over 500,000 people. It's inarguable just how encompassing this industry really was. Coal had been mined from the South Yorkshire coal field from around the 14th century, with the Barnsley bed being the most well-known seam. Owing to the location of the coal fields in this area, coal mining became one of the major industries in the north. It was also incredibly important for fueling the furnaces of the iron and steel factories that made here the industrial powerhouse that it once was. There has been mining in the borough of Barnsley for centuries, with Elsica Old Colour, for example, being sunk by 1750. By 1960, there were over 30 collieries working the Barnsley coal field, and of course, Barnsley, Maine was one of them. In 
This site is of great historical significance nationally and internationally for the complete nature of the structures here. One of the most recognisable parts, the steel headstock, comes from after 1947. The brickwork of the engine house dates back to different periods, with some stretching back as far as the early 1900s. Other notable places to see here are the tub tracks, which would have taken timber to the engine house. Pit ponies were vital for pulling the tubs. Speaking of timber as well, there's also the timber yard here. The timber would have been stacked here and then taken in the tubs to the mine to be used to prop up the tunnels to stop them from collapsing. There's also the muck stack, which was the place where waste and muck from the pit would have been put. It's been planted with oaks in recent times and provides a home for the local ecosystem. There has been deep mining on this site since the 1830s. In 1824, the Ardley Mining Company sank its first shafts. It was originally known as Oaks, given the number of oak trees that were nearby. In 1889, it was purchased by Dan Rylands, a local glass bottle businessman. It was at this time it was known as Rylands Main. Then in 1890, Barnsley Main Limited was incorporated and it's seen that the pit started to develop much more. In 1892, electric lighting was installed. In 1904, coking ovens were installed. It seemed like the pit was always on the up and up. However, it was not an easy journey and there were plenty of casualties along the way. We must remember, mining was a proud profession, but also a dangerous one. From 1700 to 2000, it is believed over 164,000 people died in the mining industry. Tragedy, accident and death were at many pits, including here. Mining was a very dangerous job owing to several threats, ranging from immediate threats such as tunnel collapses and long-term issues such as respiratory diseases. There were unfortunately very many accidents here at this site. In 1845 for example, three men were killed in a gas explosion. Gas explosions occurred when things such as combustible dust and flammable gases came into contact with a source of heat. Methane gas was quite prominent in pits as it was a byproduct of coal and that 1845 accident was just the first of many. In 1845 a fire damaged the headgear in the ventilation shaft. In 1847 at 3am a huge explosion was heard by people on the surface. This one explosion had taken the lives of 73 men and boys, with the youngest believed to have been William Carlton at just 10 years old. In 1942, 12 men were killed in an explosion, and in 1947, a fire damp explosion took the lives of 9 men and injured 21 more. Fire damp was naturally occurring gases in mines, predominantly consisting of methane. It's right in saying that this place has seen its fair share of horrors. There was also the nearby Huskar pit disaster, which saw 26 children drowned in the Huskar pit, aged between 7 and 17, after heavy rainfall and a stream had burst its banks. The children's bodies were buried together in the churchyard of All Saints Church in Silkston. This disaster led to the 1842 Mines Act, which banned any women, girls or any boys under the age of 10 from working in the pits.
Here at the Barnsley main site, however, around 28 years later, one of the darkest times in Barnsley's story was about to unfold. The Oaks Colliery Disaster of 1866, the deadliest mining disaster in English history. It was a grave time in British heritage and a stark reminder of just how deadly this industry could be. Now, Oak Colliery was already infamous for being an unsafe and gassy mine. In fact, in 1856, the workers from here went on strike over the unsafe conditions. Nevertheless, work continued and on the 12th of December, 1866, the workers paid the highest price for the dangerous conditions. A fire damp explosion tore through the pit at 1.15 p.m. causing mass destruction and death. However, this was the first day of misery for the communities as rescue efforts in the following days brought disaster with them as well. On the 13th, a party of volunteer rescuers descended into the colliery to try and save lives. In that party was a certain Parkin Jeffcock, a mining engineer, who died when another explosion occurred. On the 14th, another rescue party went in to save the sole survivor of the group that Parkin went into the colliery with. More explosions happened in the colliery over the course of the next few days. Matthew Hay, the night fireman, actually saved 90 more lives when he stopped the people from going into the colliery after noticing a change in wind, which led to poor ventilation and even more explosions. With the pit still alight and numerous explosions still occurring on the 15th, the pit was sealed to try and extinguish the fire. It was to be the deadliest English mining disaster, with around 380 men and boys having lost their lives to the explosion. The nearby Ash Row saw every house but one lose at least one family member. There was a memorial erected in 1879 and paid for by public subscription located at Christ Church in Ardsley. There's also a memorial in Barnsley Town Centre as well, showing just how long lasting and still painful the memory of this tragedy really is. The Great Depression hit and the Hoyle Mill section of the site was closed. It was in 1933 when Barnsley Main and Barrow Colliery were amalgamated. Barrow Colliery was a pit in Woodsborough that operated for 109 years until it closed in 1985. It was in 1947 that Barnsley Main became a part of the National Coal Board. In the First and Second World Wars, the coal mines were taken under government control. Given how important coal was to the nation, it is no surprise that there was a shortage following the Second World War. The Coal Industry Nationalisation Act of 1946 saw the creation of the National Coal Board. Freezing weather and fuel shortages saw a tremendous energy crisis in 1947. On the 1st of January on that year, the National Coal Board took over every colliery in Britain and a sign was put up at each site to remind people of that decision. The National Coal Board became the British Coal Corporation in 1987 before it was effectively closed a decade later. 
It was from 1966 onwards that Barnsley, Maine, along with a lot of other mining sites in Barnsley, and indeed the nation too, started to see a decline. It temporarily closed in 1966 before being reopened yet again in 1970 to gain access to Barrow Colliery. Ultimately, however, Barnsley Main stopped production in 1991, in the same year that the Soviet Union collapsed. Barnsley Main has seen its fair share of tragedies throughout the years, with lesser known events happening, such as in 1918, when one of the buckets from the aerial ropeway fell down, struck and killed the 64-year-old collier, Stephen Harper. However, it's also seen its fair share of community spirit, such as in 1915 during the First World War, when Belgian refugees came here to help work on the surface of the pit. Plus, by 1947, it was reaching an output of 1,200 tonnes of coal a day. Despite ceasing operations in 1991, Barnsley, Maine still has a future. In 2016, Barnsley, Maine Heritage Group was formed and they've done a smashing job of keeping the history alive. I work on the land mainly, cutting the grass, cutting the trees down, planting trees uh, and generally tidying up and doing stuff like that. My grandparents, my grandfathers worked down the mines and my wife's grandfather worked here, my father worked here and a brother and so and then we saw it just a delivery site left by the council and we thought we could smart it up and it's just mushroomed from then. Uh, and we meet lots of people, different people, I've met you and do something different in life. Well this was well, a dump really. It was full of rubbish, um, people were sleeping out, roughing the wood, there were fly tipping, there were drug needles and everything. It was just a terrible state and we've just cleaned it all up and I think we've given the community a belief it can be like this, so now we, we don't have that trouble anymore. I started here um, after, I was working up until the Covid pandemic. Um, we've planted about 500 saplings that we've, for, for the Queen's Canopy. I think it's for the Queen's canopy. Um, so we've planted loads and loads of baby trees all, all around. We're just waiting for them to come up. And I think in my lifetime, I might not see much of them, but hopefully we will. <laughs> well, this is where um, Alice and I normally work up there. Um, we've done quite a lot of planting up there. And, the, and they've made uh, fences as well. So, uh, small fences dividing each garden off so we've got poppies in one garden we've got herbs and, and vegetables in another and not vegetables um, fruit in another one um, and we've planted a hell of a lot of bulbs different bulbs and they're coming up so it's it's lovely to see that growing when I retired I needed a bit of something else to do you can only play so much golf and and go on holiday so come down here a couple of times a week I like volunteering a bit, I uh, like help, helping out. In, in winter, we we do edging and laying and cutting dead trees out. And then in summer, it's a full-time job, just maintaining grass and footpaths and making sure everything's safe. So yeah, uh, I don't always get twice a week, but uh, I try to get as much, because we, as I told you previous, we're getting very short of volunteers. So we do need volunteers. Uh, on the ground, we, we've got plenty, you know, we've got great admin team who do a fantastic job, but we need, we need, you know, bodies on, to, on ground to, to help us out. And that's what we're looking for now. You know, and obviously uh, we've got youngsters coming every so often, scout groups come, um, better lives come down here. So it's a safe place, uh, it's lovely. And we also be teaching kids the history of the area, they get taught all sorts of history at school, but not much about their heritage. I'm the, I'm the only the second generation of my family in 20 generations who's not been a miner. So mining plays a big part in my history. So I'd like to give a bit back for them, for my forefathers. But, 
you would never get me down that mine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great place, this. it really is. I knew some of the people that um, come here from other volunteering I've done. And I was on with another group and we came up for a walk around the site. Um, and then I realised I had a few hours free on a, on a Thursday morning. So I thought oh, I can come along and just help out because I live quite locally. But it's nice to keep the heritage and everything going and the site. So I like that sort of thing. So I just got really involved. But I mean, I only come like on you know for a couple of hours each week but they say every little helps doesn't it mainly it's planting weeding clearing the site we've done some willow weaving up at the top um just litter picking as well i brought my little granddaughter over with her, with me when she was here and we went round and and she really enjoyed it it's like splashing in the puddles the most but um, it's just keeping the site maintained really and hoping to green it out and sort of like make it better with all the trees and the plantings. We had a lady that came up to do something else and it turned out that her ancestors was one of the first people here and he'd come from Wales and it was really amazing. It tied in with, and it tied in with the disaster that happened here as well so it's just sort of like renewing them people's memories and sort of like hopefully the next generation let's say my grandchildren they've come but uh, my husband's family's from a mining uh, community so um, they'll learn that heritage that this is what they did and everything and this is where the land that they worked on so it's it's, it's really important And of course, the memories of those involved with Barnsley's mining heritage are vital to telling the story as well. I started at the number two side in 1981 and then in 1985-86 I moved across to the number four side. I was employed at Barra Colliery in Woosborough as an electrician. I was uh, promoted to electrical shift charge engineer and moved to this site. Uh, this site, uh, when I was here, this were the, uh, our offices as such. Uh, we had the electrical office, the electric shop, the electrical underground deployment. Uh, then on the top there were the deputy, deputy engineers officers for the mechanical and the under manager. So it was a small site, uh, very compact. We had the two shafts that you can see, the caps, uh, one were the uh, left hand side were a pumping shaft and the right hand side were actually plated over and we used to use it as a car park. So the pumping from the old oak shaft uh, happened every day and we knew if the pumps weren't working because the water would ingress into, the, into our main shaft here and we'd all get wet through when we were riding the shaft. So. We like to make sure that the pumps are working and everything. I've worked in the engine house here. I've been underground here, but I was never a regular traveller. First of all, on buses on the surface from Barrow to here, and then on the underground paddies, as we call them, underground trains. I've worked underground in many aspects. I've crawled through sewers. I've crawled through coal faces. Underground here, the tunnels were large, in most cases. The floor was a bit uneven. There were railway tracks, but unlike these here, all the sleepers were exposed, so you had to try and get into the habit of stepping on a sleeper, not between the sleeper or anything like that. But they weren't at a very good width apart to be able to step very easily. Most of the tunnels were arched, so if you were walking and the tunnel side was at that site, close to here, because a conveyor belt was here, you tended to be walking a bit like that. In others, some of the tunnels were large and square or rectangular, so walking, commuting underground wasn't very bad. A lot of walk, believe it or not, a lot of walking was done in coal mines for miles and miles, but whenever you could, you did an illegal ride on the conveyor belt. 
second class riding is better than first class walking or whatever the way you want to put it. Some people put it the other way. My father, John Atkinson, was under manager here in 1947 when I was born. However, his story down the pits begins in 1930, aged 14, when uh, he goes to work as a, a pony driver. Um, that was at Warncliffe Silkstone Pit. He was a haulage hand, then a borer, then a machine man, and then a deputy. And it was then that he moved um, to Barnsley, Maine. In May 1947, there was a big accident here and he was involved going down the colliery afterwards to see how it had happened and um, what damage there was. Now, in June 1947, when I was born, we lived in a NCB, National Coal Board House, and we were given a three-bedroomed house to live in, and um, we still had a lot of perks with that. My father moved to management at Rockingham and then came back to Barnsley, Maine, as an agent. Now, an agent looked after more than one colliery. By that time, we'd moved to a bigger house with four or five bedrooms. We had a gardener. In fact, I, I still remember his name, Mr. Ibbotson. Um, we had a cleaner for Mum in the house and we shared a chauffeur. And so I had a very, very privileged lifestyle. I worked at a coal mine called Dodworth Colliery. I was the sixth generation of my family to work in various coal mines in and around Barnsley. My grandfather worked at Barnsley, Maine. It's very hard work. You do lots of jobs. When I started, I was 15 years old. And initially, at that time, the law prohibited anybody going underground till you were 16 years of age. So he did various jobs on the colliery surface, stores, uh, stockyard, coal preparation plant that were on the coal mining apprentice side. If you were a craft apprentice, either an electrician, you went into the electric shop, or if you were a fitter, you went into the fitting shop on surface. And then when you were 16, you were asked if you wanted to go and do your underground training. So you then came to Barnsley, Maine, and then you go to the training centre and they will bus you from here to Grindthorpe Colliery where you started to do your underground training. And when you went to Grindthorpe Colliery you got changed in their baths, used their facilities, you went underground and you went down what they call the coping winder into the park gate seam. When you got off at the pit bottom you turned right and went up into the old Barnsley bed and that's where you did your underground training for a various amount of weeks on I had to lash, on, lash tubs on steel ropes, moving ropes. I had to do all aspects of safety with coupling and uncoupling of tubs and trams. And then when you came back, you came back to your respective colliery. I could watch this thing puffing away, winding coal and all them things when I was a little boy. I used to walk on the canal bank and come round these ways. And then uh, when I left school, what did I do? I went down the mine. And I did my training here at Barnes and Men. Although I worked at Monk Breton, Barnes and Main were in, uh, in full in, in full flow then, you know, uh, working away both shafts. I came up this shaft many many times. When you think about all the men that's gone through here, all the lives that's gone through here, all the lives that's been lost here, and there's many. On the on the commemoration day, we had 161 wooden crosses here, just here, on this site, and that were 2016. It was the 150th anniversary of the explosion in 1866. So that got interest uh, moving. And some of these people that's here now, they moved in and that were pine. And we started to clear the site. All the uh, overgrown vegetation, things like that. And we got the interest about uh, a celebration for the, uh, or a remembrance, for the 1866 disaster. So we'd a, we'd a meet we'd, we'd a big uh, well a small crowd here to commemorate it, and we got the various people here to talk, 
uh, the religious part of it and so on, and to remember it. And it went on from there. I left school in 1969. Um, Barnsley Main was very local to me, but it closed in 1966. So the nearest pit was Barra Colliery, it was Bra Village. So I took myself off to Barra Colliery and then decided I'd like to take a trade within mining. You didn't think at that stage that mining was ever going to stop, so it's a trade for life. Uh, so I became an apprentice electrician and did my four years apprenticeship. Went to college, got my Amimi honours, and then got a promotion to an assistant electrical engineer in 1979, at which point Barra Colliery was sending people on buses from Barra to Barnsley Main to go down this shaft because the coal that we were working was closer, so less transport time. If you went down Barra, it was an hour and three quarters. If you went down here, you walked to the coal face within 20 minutes. So the opportunity came to come to this end, which I did. And at the same time, round about the 1980-81, they started the refurbishment with the view that Barra would sh shut, be demolished, and the new pit here, which is the number four shaft, would be refurbished, complete new surface mine, and then all the staff would transfer. You can see the archway in the brick. That was the entrance to the shaft. This is the upcast shaft, which you can see and tell because it's boxed in. So the steelwork with the windows, the upcast shaft was connected to a fan. The fan was around the back and it runs into the shaft about 20 metres down the shaft itself. And that draws air up. Now, if it wasn't boxed in, you'd get a short circuit of air. It'd suck it from the outside here. So that archway there was covered in roughly to where we are here. And materials being sent down the pit and the men used to go into airlocks, which was built out here. So you'd go through the first door when you got material in or when you got the people in that door was shut behind you the inside door opened and you'd pass to the shaft side uh, basically it was working 24 hours a day when it wasn't winding men the materials were going down the shaft at this side and when the empty tubs came out they went out of the back and around that way to go back up there to be refilled and come back down. So, hive of activity. Barnsley, Maine. It's seen the exchange of several owners and lots of tragic events but it's also a piece of mining heritage to be proud of. And it's not just some old bricks and metal either, oh no. These great two listed buildings are a connection to the past, the story of mining that helped shape this nearby area and the nation. Thanks to the effort of the volunteers, the story of this fantastic piece of heritage can be shared with all, and most importantly, be kept alive for the future.